First up, apologies for the delay in getting a film up recently. Normal service though is about to be resumed. This one's a slightly different kind of number from our usual content though, but will be relevant to a great number of you or people you're close to. We all know frontline workers are at increased risk of contracting COVID-19 due to the nature of their work. But did you know that so far in the UK, 1,500 healthcare workers have died due to contracting COVID through their work? And a further 122,000 are unable to work due to long COVID. Other countries have recorded proportionately far fewer healthcare worker infections. Why is this? Was the personal protective equipment, or PPE, given to our healthcare workers adequate? My frequent collaborator, Dr. Asad Khan, contracted COVID in the course of his work and is still unable to work nine months after becoming ill. Here, he discusses the issue of PPE and a shocking dereliction of duty by government agencies with an expert panel. Morning, everyone. Uh, could I, uh, first of all, just start by um, asking you to give a bit of background about yourselves? Uh, starting with uh, David. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. And thanks for invi inviting me here. Um, so I'm Dave Tomlinson. I'm a cardiologist from uh, uh, Plymouth. Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm kind of speaking in my capacity as uh, a member of Fresh Air NHS uh, today. Uh, so what's cardiologist doing uh, talking about this? So uh, I'm useless in a pandemic, right? So I had nothing to do uh, from uh, March, April, May, pretty much. But before that, I made a bit of noise about preprints and open science and transparency uh, in my world of EP. And so I'd become a med archive affiliate. So what that meant is I'd had a drip feed of preprints to uh, read through since January 2020. And so that that gave me this sense that um, the government was embarking on some plans that weren't altogether in our best interests. And so I'd, I, I also thought that I should know a bit more about the virus to help me and others understand what we could do to mitigate transmission. So I'd had a, uh, a sort of interest through Med Archive. Um, yeah, and through realising the problem with the lack of PPE to all those poor souls that were looking after patients with uh, COVID like yourselves, then uh, it became more of a passion to just share the latest uh, data on um, the modes of transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So that's what I've been doing for months and months and months. So Fresh Air NHS was set up uh, by chance meeting through Twitter in uh, late November, early December. Um, and then things have kind of gone through uh, with us having various brick walls that we banged our heads against and uh, most recently got to know Helen and the patient safety learning team. And um, through the hub, very kindly able to share my story of the emails I've been sending to uh, various government organisations to try and get PPE uh, guidance changed dating back to November. Um, so that's me. So I'm here to just hope to help uh, drive that forward because we're still dealing with IPC guidelines that are felt to be mandatory and that we know don't mitigate adequately an airborne transmitted virus, which is what SARS-CoV-2 is. Thanks for joining us, David. Rachel, a bit about yourself. So hi, um, my name is Rachel Moses. I am a respiratory physiotherapist by background. And obviously that, that's my kind of day job. And throughout the pandemic, I've had a couple of different roles. So being a clinician also um, helped set up the Nightingale response um, from an allied health professional perspective. So for those of you that don't know, the AHPs are 14 groups, include physios, speech and language therapists, paramedics, um, OTs dietitians, et cetera. And um, really just, I am an advocate for AHPs in terms of their needs and protection. Um, I'm speaking mainly on behalf of respiratory physiotherapy, but also on behalf of the allied health professionals who were affected by the lack of PPE guidance with regards to not just AGPs, but high risk procedures. And I think that's probably why I'm here because I was very vocal at the start, having had experience of other pandemic situations, um, not just in this country, but, but overseas, and really just advocating how we could develop our own local guidelines um, that didn't align with the Public Health England guidance initially, um, just so we could protect our workforce, kind of knowing a little bit that was what we were going to be facing if it was as bad as what we feared, which of course we all know it was. So yeah, that, that's kind of my history. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And also um, don't uh, 
let's not forget that you are the president elect of the British Thoracic Society, which is my society, and you're also placement coordinator for Mechlet Palestinians. So many, many worthy hats. So thanks for joining us, Rachel. Helen, a bit about yourself. Oh, lovely to join you and thank you so much for the invite. So I'm Helen Hughes. I'm Chief Exec of Patient Safety Learning. We're a small charity getting bigger. Uh, we've been around about three years, uh, an independent voice for patient safety. And as you'd expect charities to do, a lot of it is about policy influence, awareness raising, campaigning. And in, in, in that we do kind of represent, listen to and promote the patient safety front line. And by that, we mean patients and staff because patient and staff safety, two sides of the same coin, right? So that's a, a, a really strong uh, part of our work. But what we want to do is to be an organization that helps organizations deliver more safely. So with some how-to tools. And one of the ways we do that, David's already referred to the hub, uh, and I'd very much like to plug that, is our free learning platform for patient safety. Huge amount of knowledge and resources on there. And we use it to promote uh, good practice, um, peer review journals. We invite people to give their perspectives, whether they're staff or, or patients and, they, uh, and blog. And we picked up obviously very early on the huge issues around COVID and particularly the impact of COVID on non-COVID care. Um, uh, and, and that's uh, been real, you know, realized now with the scale of uh, elective, uh, elective weights. But very, very early on focusing on long COVID and working with long COVID support groups and promoting the need for their um, for services to be provided from assessment centers and services. And I, I sit on the national task force uh, and that, uh, that agenda is still to be realized. I think uh, it's moving, but too slowly in a number of our views. And then we've been working with, uh, I think the first blog we did was with Dr. Jake Suet and that got sort of, I don't know, 13,000 views. Uh, and we were delighted to be able to promote his perspectives on long COVID as a, as a clinician, as a doctor and with personal experience. And then we've build, we been building some of those resources up. So we do have a kind of a patient and a staff perspective because we're looking at safety as, as being core to the healthcare system and making sure that safety is paramount. And, and I think from the work we've done with David and some of the science, you, you've got to wonder whether or not that's been the main focus on some of the guidance that's been issued. Thank you, Helen. Right, so I'll kick off uh, with some questions. So David, for the benefit of um, viewers who might not be familiar with terminology, um, what is the difference between airborne transmission and droplet transmission? Um, yeah, so I haven't muted myself, that's good. So uh, essentially, it's a weird thing because you've got human beings who produce a continuous stream of airborne particles, particles that are in the air. Um, they're of all different sizes. Some of them will remain aloft for a long period of time and some of them will drop to the ground. And of course their size um, and their air, you know, that determines their aerodynamic properties principally, uh, but also airflow within the room will determine how quickly they drop to the floor. And there has been a convention in the infection control world. This is what you find out when you do a bit of reading about this and uh, people's health depends on it. There's been a convention to dichotomize uh, particles that remain airborne, released particles that remain airborne, as greater or less than five microns in diameter to determine whether they're droplets, dropping, you know, with, uh, uh, sort of according to certain physical laws, uh, sort of typically within two meters of the source, versus remaining airborne for potentially hours. So that's incorrect in terms of the size. That's been, been shown in, in data that's become more widely known um, in this pandemic, 100 microns diameter is that which determines whether a particle remains aloft for hours. So the key thing is whether the virus is contained within fluids that are aerosolized. So humans are aerosol generating people. We speak, we breathe, we um, sing, we cough, we sneeze, and we release airborne particles that um, evaporate so the moment they come away from our mouths they you know it changes the uh, humidity so they'll shrink 
and those uh, so that that creates this cloud of particles that will be a mixture of things that according to what activity we're doing if we're speaking I'm kind of releasing these bigger ones and um, so so there'll be some that drop within a radius of me but then I'll be constantly releasing like you see a smoker when they're blowing out smoke they'll be releasing this plume of particles that remain airborne so the key thing as to whether a virus is transmitted via an airborne route is number one whether it's uh, contained within fluids that are aerosolized. Well, respiratory viruses are contained within fluids that are aerosolized during normal physiological processes, breathing, singing, speaking, etc. Um, and that's been shown back to the mid 2000s data on how much is released and this continuum of particle si sizes. So then the step two is, is it viable in those particles? And that's been shown very elegantly in early March. This was the, the sort of penny dropping moment for me. Just again, chance seeing a preprint in March from a group that later published it in the New England Journal. They use this thing called a Goldberg drum, which you'll have heard of. So it's, it's this uh, sealed container. You can control the environment very carefully, uh, mimic uh, normal environments not create particularly you know virus prolonging environments uh, and you can then sample progressively over a few hours after aerosolizing the uh, a virus mixture uh, so that's an artificial element to it obviously as well as the um, controlled uh, environment but that showed virus viability very much along the same lines as SARS-1 uh, so you know up to 16 hours the virus was found to be viable and could be grown in tissue culture. So the virus is contained within fluids that are aerosolized during normal physiological processes. Those aerosols don't kill the virus. The virus is alive within those. So the final step is, can those aerosols meet um, the receptors, meet the tissue receptors? So uh, as you'll know, we're, we're, we're blessed with having ACE2 receptors throughout our airway, but they predominate in the kind of upper airway, the sinuses and so on, uh, but also type two pneumocytes. So there is a very small, modest area of surface area to impact with a larger volume uh, particles. And there's a thick layer of mucus. So quite a big barrier. The type two pneumocytes, well, if you had a thick layer of mucus there, you would not exchange gases. So by definition, there's no impediment to meeting the receptors. So these dehydrated particles are inhaled. There's free transmission of particle sizes of less than five microns. This is where the five microns becomes kind of useful uh, in that those are freely inhaled deep into the uh, lung parenchyma. Uh, and then it's, of course, they're hydroscopic. So, so they plump up and then they just gravitate out and stick to the alveolar walls. So you get this wonderful ability of uh, uh, an airborne particle that can last for many hours in the environment that maintains virus viability for many hours in, in the environment to go directly to the receptors. Uh, the combination of ACE2 and this other one, I don't know how, how to say it, but Tempress2. Um, uh, so the, those are co-located on type 2 pneumocytes, so a perfect recipe for infection via the airborne route. And, th and this is why in uh, you know flu and other airborne virus, uh, it's, it's unethical to give flu to donor recipient experiments it's a, it's unethical to do that via the airborne route by an aerosol because they get too severe an infection it has to be via intranasal inoculation because they're much less severe infection so in the same way in SARS-CoV-2 a couple of months ago it's shown in macaques how you get a much more severe infection if you give a macaque an aerosol um, from the same aerosol used in the Goldberg drum experiments uh, Collinson nebulizer uh, and you need 500 times less dose to get a more severe disease when you give that via an aerosol. That's spectacular. So basically what you're saying is that somebody can be in a room, have SARS-CoV-2, breathe it out, leave the room, the virus stays in the air, and somebody else could enter it hours later and inhale the virus and become ill. Yeah, they could. And, and, and the dominant route of uh, transmission has been the kind of moot Point. There's been a, a, an arguing over whether droplets predominated or, 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 you know, the aerosols. If you think about it, so if I'm facing you, in order for me to give you a droplet dose, there has to be a perfect number of things lining up in terms of physical laws. So, I, you know, these behave like bullets, the larger ones. So I, I have to have the perfect height difference, the perfect mm. velocity, the perfect direction. You, that's my behaviour. Your behavior has to be perfectly facing me. You have to be not blinking. Your mucous membranes have to be open. The tricky thing in terms of behavioral 
terms, it's very difficult for you to then mitigate, modify these really good defense mechanisms you've got in your upper airway towards an, an appreciable dose of virus actually hitting a receptor. You can't help but obey the behavior that we all have to do, which is to inhale. So you're inhaling my air <laughs> at seven liters a minute and you can't help but have that inhaled air go straight to your receptors. So the dominant route is via aerosol, no doubt, in terms of basic physical principles. Um, Rachel, um, could you just perhaps explain to our viewers what an aerosol generating procedure is in the sort of traditional sense as defined by Public Health England and other bodies and whether you think that's accurate? So the list by Public Health England has been updated, I think, a couple of times, but hasn't really changed. Um, and I suppose the th first thing I'd like to say is that this, this list is devised by experts in the field and more recently involved the Nerve Tag Group. Um, so we, I always feel like I kind of respect, have to really respect these people because it's their lifetime work. It's not a group of people who are just putting this stuff together. Um, in terms of what the list shows, it's basically everything Dave's just said. So it's a, it's a procedure that's defined uh, that will either result in aerosol generation or will cause a shearing effect that will result in aerosol generation and particle spread and therefore poses an increased risk of respiratory transmission. And that's particularly important in pandemic times because, um, you know, there's much higher risk to everyone. One of the things with Public Health England list is that if something's an AGP, it's an AGP. So it's an AGP in normal times and in pandemic times. The list at the moment um, kind of doesn't, from my perspective as a respiratory physiotherapist, doesn't include things that I would perceive not only to be potential AGPs, therefore pose a risk but also high risk procedures so I think Dave touched on it there for me there's something around difference between aerosol generating procedure and droplet spread and increased risk procedures that have increased risk to clinical staff in a clinical setting um, so for me the list is there for everyone to see I mean it's on the government website and there has also been some more recent reviews around what isn't defined as an AGP, but is a droplet spread procedure or a high risk procedure. Um, so do I agree with it? Well, obviously not, because chest physiotherapy isn't on there. But one of the things I'd done in February 2020 was translate that list in, into making it protect my staff, which, you know, are respiratory allied health professionals. So, for example, um, things around tracheostomy procedures, things about oral pharyngeal suction, um, for example, fees procedures, so fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallow wasn't classed as an AGP, even though you're uncertain, you know, um, something into the nasopharynx and produces cough and, um, you know, so, um, and then it's the, it's, then it's what you're asking the patients to do during that moment in time as well so either cough inducing procedures or procedures that get someone to become out of breath um and you know respiratory therapists are the only professionals they're the only professionals that encourage cough um we we're the ones that are asked to go along and get that sputum out so that includes covid patients and i think a lot of healthcare professionals maybe are the policy makers maybe forget that we're the ones that are actually doing that and you know it's it's always it's always quite comical because the nurses will always leave the room and will be like no come and stay and help us and this I think that in itself causes anxiety for staff so do I agree with the list not all of it no but I do respect it I just think there needs to be more evidence and more studies that's the problem we just don't have the clear evidence thank you <clears throat> thanks Rachel um Ellen why is it important for the public to understand this um I think uh, ooh, for a number of reasons. One, I think, you know, an informed public uh, is better able to make judgments about their own safety and their own health. Um, so if you if people are putting themselves at risk and others at risk, if they don't know that, then they will continue to those kind of risky behaviours. Um, and if they don't feel there are any consequences either to themselves or others, then that will generate more yeah. transmission so it you know on on the principle of an informed informed and scientifically aware public is a good thing then yes because otherwise you're just reliant on information that's being transmitted to you from 
you know, either the government uh, and authoritative sources uh, like PHE, even if the, the, it's not quite complete. Uh, and without that knowledge, people will be, I mean, there's quite a lot today in, in the States, um, Fauci and the FDA talking about misinformation through social media and how people are reliant on that as a source of insight uh, and are, are taking taking action or, or, or not mitigating risk on the basis of that. So a generally informed public is a, is a good thing. Um, uh, it's really important because the public need to know how much at risk our, uh, our staff are, our healthcare staff are. And, and it's, you know, this is, a, this is a personal view, but I mean, if you're gonna be clapping on a Thursday night for staff, you need to turn that clapping into action and understanding that healthcare staff are at risk. And if they're at risk, that's not a good thing. You know, people are working incredibly hard during the pandemic. They have been amazing and they are exhausted and we should be doing everything we can to protect them uh, because protecting healthcare staff is a good thing, but also healthcare staff look after us as patients. So if there are fewer healthcare staff doing the right thing, then there's more vulnerability for us as patients. So the um, so I think there's also that the, the sense that um, because the workforce crisis is immense and has been for many years, um, the Royal College of Nursing came out this week and and uh, or I think last couple of weeks with new uh, workforce standards and nursing standards in terms of. Um, you know, 50,000 nursing vacancies and what are you going to do about it? Uh, and reinforcing that. So the health service is having to respond to those vacancies with a changing roles, using less qualified staff uh, just to be able to carry on the services. If that then means that staff are potentially uh, not able to isolate in the way that they should, but are, are being encouraged to continue uh, providing services to patients, then those patients and the public would be concerned that they may become you know, asymptomatic people, uh, staff may be transmitting um, to patients. And that's a real worry. And we're, we're seeing that this week with, um, uh, with uh, concerns expressed by by uh, women that are giving birth that they're going to come into hospitals and they are they are vulnerable because of this. I, I think it's not just um, a session I was on yesterday, uh, a survey that hasn't yet been published, but it, it is 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 pre pip pre pip review stage shows that there's a number of other risks that are happening. Um, uh, uh, shops infection, uh, sharps, needle stick injuries is usually on service about 5%. This kind of survey by the RCN of 7,000 people shows that's up to 29%. So the, 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 the pressure that people are working under in different environments without the, the infrastructure to support them, there are lots of areas that are demonstrating that staff are, are, are more at risk during the pandemic. Thanks, Helen. So David, um, was it known at the beginning of the pandemic that SARS-CoV-2 was airborne. So was there enough evidence? And if there was, how it, did it unfold that the PhD guidance that we had and continue to have at the moment um, maintains that a surgical mask and a plastic apron and gloves are enough? So obviously this answer is born of having read a bit. So I can't now an answer, uh, answer as if it was back in January, March, mm. whatever, 2020. But one has to, understanding infectious diseases now a bit more than I did then, one has to go from basic principles. So um, it's quite nice actually, WHO themselves in their 2014 guidance for Ebola have this very nice statement. Scientists are unaware that any virus has dramatically changed its mode of transmission. Okay, so that's in the WHO uh, IPC for, for Ebola. So, so then if you recognise that in 2003, the SARS-1, SARS coronavirus, the only one that was there, uh, was demonstrated to be airborne, you realise that on first principles, it's a SARS coronavirus, you're going to call it number two. But it's, it's SARS coronavirus. So it will be transmitted via the airborne route. Now, SARS-1, patients, as you probably know, more infectious towards the later stage in their disease, and there was some faecal aerosolization, which was found to be important in transmission, but it's an aerosol transmitted, an airborne tra transmitted virus. So if you like quite correctly, 
uh, you know, experts on nerve tag and uh, those advising the government designated this a high consequence infectious disease, uh, but an airborne high consequence infectious disease was a full designation of SARS coronavirus 2. Um, so uh, that was the presumption, and there's this term precautionary principle, which is kind of banded around a lot in infection control circles, just, you know, act on the basis of what will be really bad to get wrong. Um, so it's, it's right to do that with any new organism that's that's causing a respiratory infection because we know on basic principles that respiratory fluids have the virus usually when you get a respiratory infection and you can create all these particles which can then be inhaled so you presume it's going to be viable in aerosols and you presume it's going to behave like its brother SARS-1 um, so uh, yes the, and that was a presumption as, as you know if, you know if you look at the first papers from nerve tag and sage um, they describe um, you know, pe people using full airborne PPE, but then there's this unusual little chain of, of, of you know, what's what's in the minutes. And I, I'm not going to come out with any names, but and people can read 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 for themselves. And you can't get a judge of what really is going on in the room in or on the in the Zoom when you just read the minutes. But there was clearly a recognition from uh, more than one clinician that there was a shortage of airborne PPE, FFP3 respirators. So then you have this, um, these terms that are used are quite unusual. It, it's made clear that there's a shortage. And then it's made clear that Public Health England, PHE, is creating new infection control guidance and that it's already got this created. And then you have representatives from Public Health England coming and presenting at nerve tags saying, and you can read this in the nerve tag minutes, saying we are not really sure whether this is more likely to cause a transmission event when the patient's on ITU. But we think because they're sicker patients, they're probably going to be higher risk and the nurses have to spend a lot of time in close contact with the patients. So what we're going to do, we've got this new IPC guidance, we're going to infection prevention control I, IPC. We're, 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 we've got it prepared and we're going to basically allow ICU teams to keep going with their airborne PPE, but we're going to change the guidance so that uh, general ward uh, clinical teams can use a surgical mask instead. Now, the problem with that is when you look at the minutes, then you look at SAGE uh, minutes, you realise that there was uh, the earliest Wuhan data was already circulated throughout SAGE. And a lot of people on SAGE sit on nerve tag as well. And they knew that the peak infectious viral load for SARS coronavirus 2 was early in the disease. So typically at the time of symptom onset and waning so that by day five, there's a very really hugely much lower viral load. And they also had data from uh, China, again, I believe, but that showed the, the peak hospital data, I, sorry, day from symptom onset to I2 admission was day eight. So, so they knew on the natural history that you had peak viral loads early and that when they got to ITU, it wasn't that they were day one on ITU, it was day mm. eight. So the viral loads by inference would be lower. So they then they knew this from a, a few weeks before. So they then have this public health England representative saying, yeah, yeah, it's all fine. We're changing, but don't worry because they're the highest risk patients. So I would I, I worry about what was going on in people's minds there. Uh, receiving that information when they knew from if they'd read the manuscripts that by the time patients went to IT, went to ITU, they were less infectious. There, there's this other aspect to it, which is great, which is that ICUs are ventilated much better. So the minimum standards for mechanical air change is 10 air changes an hour on ICU, whereas general COVID, well, gen, general wards, the minimum air change per hour is three mechanical and then the remaining three because it should have six air changes per hour minimum standard according to 2007 regs at least so six air, air changes are reached by virtue of having windows open but we all know how often we, windows aren't open so you've got most infectious patients coming to the least well ventilated areas meeting staff with surgical masks on that the health and safety executive in 2008 demonstrated to be not PPE because they found aerosols behind every single mask compared to the FFP3s, a hundredfold filtration effect. Um, 
and meeting patients that were very much aerosol releasing. So they're coughing, they're speaking, they're breathing. So they're releasing aerosols. When you're on a closed circuit on ITU, you don't release any aerosols. So it's a very hard thing to read back on and think, you know, people in the room should have known. Okay, whether they knew or not, but the, the manuscripts are there. They knew what the ventilation rigs were. They knew it was airborne based on infection control basic principles. So they allowed the guidance to change because of a lack of PPE, not because the biological behavior of this organism was known to be out of keeping with an airborne. And just one more point. If you think about it, how does an organism purely transmit via a droplet route? Well, the only way it can do that is if it has to, it has to do a remarkable number of things. It has to instantaneously measure every single particle that's released. It has to instantaneously be aware of the diameter of every particle. So it only is infectious on droplets. It has to move from everything that's an aerosol onto a droplet, or it has to die on every aerosol. Well, we know it doesn't do that from the experiments from March. So anyway, so, but it also has to be aware of human beings convention for what is an aerosol, what's a droplet when it's a continuous variable, right? So it has to have been doing studies on the human race to know what RIPC <laughs> conventions are. And also coming to AGPs and the experts like you, I'd like to be able to respect the experts. I respect people who get things right and who, when they get things wrong, accept it, own it, learn from it and tell other people about it to share. So they would, looking at the AGP list, have to accept that when a human being produces aerosols using these normal physiological processes, and they're all saying, yeah, 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 but it's droplet transmitted. It is inconceivable that those two things are correct. Absolutely. And I think um, two thoughts here. Firstly, if there was a shortage of PPE, surely the solution is to source more rather than dumb down the guidance. And secondly, it was evident very early on that despite people wearing the downgraded PPE and washing their hands till they bled, staff were becoming ill and staff were dying. And why, why did nobody pick up on this and say, actually, what we're doing is wrong. People are being harmed. They're at risk. We should be erring on the side of caution. The question should not be, um, is SARS-CoV-2 airborne? The question should be, are we absolutely certain that it's not? And we weren't. Rachel. Um, I just want to follow on from Dave's point about the emergent evidence at the beginning of the pandemic. So I'm very fortunate. I have a role as a multimedia editor with Thorax BMG, and I was asked to do a podcast with Prof. Alex Richter, who's from an amazing, um, amazing clinician from the University Hospitals of um, Birmingham. And they produced a paper. They've done a snapshot study two days in April 2020. And basically the, the end point was that those healthcare workers that were wearing surgical masks in a hospital got COVID. And they also picked up a disparity finding for those that were from ethnic minorities. So those that were from ethnic minorities were more likely to get COVID-19. And this is staff, healthcare worker and staff. And also um, if they were on respiratory wards with surgical masks. So the evidence, if you wanted the evidence was act these brilliant clinicians creating the evidence for us and I just want to say just in, in reference to Dave's comment about looking at the local evidence as well trusts like mine are absolutely fantastic I wrote a guideline that went against public health England guidance my director of nursing um, at the time supported that and said yes you guys can wear full PPE for your procedures because they're going to be high risk we're going to protect you our staff rates of sickness were low. I mean, I have never had COVID. I've never had COVID and I've worked in multiple ICUs and respiratory wards the last 80 months. The trust that didn't do that, their staff sickness rates. I mean, there was one London hospital where their respiratory physios were completely wiped out their on-call teams. Um, this one patient, um, it was a CF patient who produced sputum but also had COVID and affected, you know, so many of the staff because we were wearing surgical masks. So I completely agree. If we think back to where we're then, we've got it wrong. We as a community got it wrong in respiratory. 
critical care was the most protected area because you had filters on the ventilator machines, we weren't disconnecting the circuits, we weren't doing any, any high risk procedures. Yes, they need to wear full PPE, absolutely. But actually, there were spiritual wards with patients who were coughing, who were, you know, they were the high risk wards, in my opinion. Um, so we're looking forward, we can never go back, we can never question that ever again. Um, you're on a high risk ward, whatever that may be, particularly respiratory, respiratory high care, it's full PPE. This, this shouldn't even be a conversation now. And if the government won't say that, if public health anyone won't say that, nerve tag on saying that, I think this is when it comes down to the clinicians working with the people that make these decisions and say, we have all the evidence you need, we can present it, use these papers, use everything that Dave said, use your clinicians. Um, and then the default, the end point for me is that um, if cost is the if cost is the real driver in this, then buy your staff personal respirators because for thirty quid with fillers that only need changed every six months, that is a very cost effective intervention rather than wearing one FFP three every four to six hours. Or thank you. Uh, yeah, I know, uh, Helen. You wanted to come in here. Yeah, it, it kind of like the. I suppose the broader context for this around decision making and what we see from inquiries into catastrophic accidents in other industries, you know, a, a critical point of, of, of understanding is, is the points that both Rachel and Dave have made about acknowledging when uh, you haven't got it right, learning, transmitting that information and people making decisions on it. So you can you can look at decision making routes that have caused catastrophic failure from, you know, the challenger O-rings to you could look at the, these these issues in that same context where where um, the, the the knowledge was there it was fast moving but people weren't listening and the, and the broad uh, and why and the broad issue um, the contextual issue is around from a patient safety learnings perspective so much evidence about um, the the organization culture in healthcare is not listening to your frontline clinicians not listen, not listening to your patients either but in this context yeah. frontline clinicians not hearing what it's like in reality not picking up the evidence quickly enough and and I think what will, will be fascinating uh, for an inquiry and there really does need to be an inquiry was this that what what we're talking about here and what Dave's been saying and I think you get a super sleuth award for all the work you've been doing it's just <laughs> amazing but it is that this is not hindsight bias you know, both Rachel and Dave have given examples of where the knowledge was there back in March 2020 and then has been built on and has been vocalised through the Fresh Air group, through others, but still not being listened to. And why are those barriers? And I, I suppose the reflection is, yes, there were financial constraints, uh, but I think more, you know, physical constraints of the PPE wasn't available. So they were prioritizing. And I think in light of what you've been saying in the science, the prioritization decisions were wrong because they were putting them in the critical care area as was actually the highest risk for staff was somewhere else. And therefore the highest risk for, for patients was somewhere else. So those prioritization decisions were, were poor. Um, but why now? are they still not listening despite this? I mean, I think, you know, Rachel's guidance that you produced, why is not that shared wide, wide, widely? And yeah. we are seeing, in terms of the data, significant variation across NHS organisations. And that is unacceptable. If we can do good practice in one, we need to learn quickly and to share and promote that. Because actually not doing that, I think, is is there's a there's a le there could be a legal challenge to that um, under health and safety legislation. You know you need to take and CQC should be um, regulating on the basis you need to take all reasonable and practical steps. Well, it is reasonable and practical to take good practice and apply it. And if you resist that and continually to resist it, as Dave may say about some of the ventilation uh, improvements some hospitals have been making, if you fail to do that, then you're failing in your legal responsibility as well as your moral responsibility. Uh, I mean, absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Helen. And, and Rachel, um, I think you're absolutely right. People can't claim that they were following guidance uh, because, as you said, if the PAT won't say it, and if the trusts won't say it, then individual clinicians, clinical directors, directors of nursing 
they still have a responsibility, given the fact that the knowledge is there, to protect their staff. Um, and you know, following orders, where have we heard that before? That is not going to wash. And um, just coming back to the whole issue of um, listening to frontline workers, I mean, it was quite the opposite. Uh, the experience um, that uh, a lot of us had was that if you dared to question the official mm. line, mm. So if you said, actually, I'm going to protect myself, I'm going to wear an FFP3, I'm going to wear a full sleeve gown, um, an army of infection control clinicians would march down and say that you were violating um, the PHA guidance or the trust guidance. Uh, I have heard of clinicians who were at risk because they were older and lame and had risk factors, um, having been told that they had to remove their FFP3 respirators. Um, people being told that they were causing anxiety uh, among nursing staff, they were being poor examples to junior doctors, they were scaring the patients. And what is staggering about all of this is that these are clinicians. I mean, we should be our own biggest supporters and advocates. Yet, what happens to us when we get into a position with a bit of power and responsibility that we just forget why we are there in the first place? Rachel. Yeah, I'm completely with you here. And I think this is where your system leaders come in. So one of the things about a pandemic is that it creates chaos, it creates uncertainty. Um, you know, if you think back to February, March 2020, um, there was a lot of stuff really worried, not only for themselves, for the children, for their, you know, vulnerable others they might have lived with. So what you need is calm and clarity. Now, for me, there's a common sense approach to this. And this is an approach that I took in, you know, February um, 2020. And I thought, what do we know from SARS-1? Well, everything Dave said, we know that it's airborne. We know that it attacks the, you know, the, the, the virus attacks the respiratory cells. There's a high likelihood that this is going to behave in the same manner. So that, that's a common sense approach for me. OK, within my remit, within respiratory medicine, what do I know is going to be high risk? Does Public Health England protect us? No, it doesn't. So what I'm going to do is produce local guidelines, because that's all I can do to create calm within my organisation, within my teams, that will protect myself. Now, what I need is a key stakeholder, stakeholders involved. So I need the people, like you said, who are going to be the decision makers who have the power. And if you work in an organisation where that exists and you have those communication chains, and again, I'm very grateful to the director of nursing, she's called Sarah Collins, we're going to give her a shout out. And she and I produced this. I also remember I spent a weekend doing it and I said, I need your sign off and she gave it. And then that's when we got infection control involved. Now, when you just decide that if some staff are going to wear FFP3s and some staff aren't, that creates uncertainty for the staff, particularly the nurses, I have to say. Um, and they're like, well, why is the physios wearing that mask and we're not allowed to? And we want that mask and why mm. they got that mask. So then it's communication. And then for us, it was like, OK, well, if we're going to call this an AJP, we'll have to follow that guidance. So that means it's in a closed room. Staff, if they're entering, have to wear FFP3 as well. You know, the can't come in with a surgery mask. It has to be the same rules for everyone. And that's how you create the common consistency. Now, there was a problem with PPE provision. In London, it got really bad at one point and we relied on mutual aid. So there was a hub, all the PPE, the ventilators were in a hub. If someone was at crisis point, so they less, had less than 24 hours, they would take from someone else, you know, would give it. That's the only way we survived. And there was other areas across the country that had done that. We've been told we're never going to have that problem ever again. But we knew from pre-pandemic times that we would have a problem if we had a respiratory pandemic because we didn't have enough. So the information was already there. So I think what we've got to learn when we come out of this one, and we're not, we're in wave four, four now, three or four, depending on where you are. But when we do start the full recovery phase of this, this is what we have to go back and say, actually, there is going to be the AGPs, there's going to be high risk procedures. This is the research gaps where we need the evidence. But actually, like Dave said, actually, this is where the evidence already is as well. So let's not repeat it. What more do we need to convince you that this is the right Thing for staff to protect them on the front line and then I think we're also the the whole I mean we're talking very much acute care here um 
you know, secondary care, but then my primary care colleagues in the community as well with care homes and, and what ambulance staff or paramedics. There's a whole other spectrum of this as well, because like you said, we'll have to work together and protect each other because of one part of the system um you know is either failed or isn't protected that affects all of us so it's about system leaders it's about listening to the evidence and the experts that are already out there but it's also learning from what failures and you know if anything those poor deaths making them ha- count and you know us us respecting that as well and i think that's what you said at the beginning what we've got wrong but what we're getting right now yeah, absolutely. And, you know, 1,500 health and social care workers dead. And that's ongoing. 122,000 NHS staff off with long COVID. Uh, and I think this is a point that often gets missed. Um, you know, it's not a binary disease. You don't just either recover or become ill and go to ICU. There is this long COVID in the middle, which is horrendous. And when the government says we're going to have to learn to live with COVID, (laughs) this is what it looks like. It's miserable. And despite the fact that we have vaccination now and most most healthcare staff are vaccinated, you know, you can still get mild COVID and you can still get long COVID from mild COVID. Um, I just want to talk a bit about openness. So, I mean, we have these freedom to speak up guardians. We're meant to have this open and honest culture in the NHS, but there seems to be um, a difference between uh, that language and the reality. And I wondered if Helen could comment on that. Um, And I know you've got your hand up as well. (laughs) Thank you, I will will come back to that. I I would like to just reinforce, I think, um, that this is an issue for now. This isn't just reflecting back on what happened in the early days. So I was reading this morning, um, the CDC in the States have just uh, shown that their increase, that their daily, uh, what they said, that their seven day average of COVID-19 cases has jumped 70% in the last week. And the US has more than 33,000 new cases. Now that was shocking until you think about the UK rate where we had 47,000 new cases. So this is, this is a real, issue now and I I completely agree with you Asad about if you look at the data that is available to the public and again the first question you asked me why is it important for the public to know well so that they can you know inform and demand action by policymakers and politicians and others but um, uh, the data is about the number of cases uh, new cases and the deaths There is nothing in the national statistics about the number of people with long COVID. It's almost like the invisible impact of the disease. So those of us that have had experience of it directly or working with people that are experiencing long COVID, and and as I said, we, we work with the long COVID support group and some of the other groups, it's a tremendous um burden on people the the debilitating impact on people's lives it's horrendous as I said kind of you 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 know and it's almost like it's it's seen to be inconsequential and I wonder you know that the the younger people that are choosing not to be vaccinated and think that it won't affect them greatly you know that's contributing to a, a real problem here and so I think there's something about the transparency of that data that is that really should be uh, driving policy um, uh, uh, and public health policy on this, but back to your to your question about culture, it is the single most important issue around patient safety. From the last twenty years of research, um, and have we published um, a, a report, uh, a blueprint for action that summarises. 15 to 20 years of evidence on patient safety. And we've we've drawn out what are the fundamental foundations for patient safety for organizations and systems to change. And they are around, they're about leadership, they're about having you know, professional people that understand safety risk and do, um, they're about sharing knowledge, uh, data and performance, lots of stuff. But the single most important thing is around culture and whether you've got a culture that it not only um, recognises that people need to speak up, but celebrates and supports people speaking up. So the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian um, model is a is a useful one. Uh, and if you don't have a culture, then it, it 
maybe it's helpful, but it is putting potentially in some places, putting a sticking plaster on a culture that doesn't work. So we need to listen to staff. We need to find ways of not just listening, but celebrating and thanking people for speaking up the, uh, the inconvenient truths and then acting on it, just knowing that these things, um, uh, and unless we do that, we, we, do, we see it over and over again in a whole range of issues, including during the pandemic. Um, your examples there, Asad, are, 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 are shocking how pay, people are vilified for speaking up for their own safety and, and of others. And we fundamentally need to change that. Uh, and that has to be um, top down and bottom up. So top down, you've got to have system leaders, policymakers driving this really importantly. And there are super organizations that are making big inroads onto this. Um, people talk about Mersey Care because they're, they're, they're the magic child here. They've done so much work, but there are, there are areas of good practice. And then it has to be bottom up where yeah. clinicians with the support of patients groups say enough, no more, our voices must be heard. And part of what we want to do as a charity is to, is to listen and amplify those voices. But I think it, it is patient safety, staff safety as a social movement. Thank you, Dave. Um, so even if there was a shortage, which clearly there was in some areas, particularly at the beginning of PPE, uh, my understanding is that by June 2020, there wasn't really a problem um, that was significant. So what is it that prevented the guidance from being corrected then? And why even a year after that, we are still stuck with the same faulty guidance. I'm, I'm struggling to understand the thought process, the barriers, and I really appreciate your opinion on this. So the short story is that there is a culture of uh, a sort of lack of ownership of, of guidance. Um, so nerve tag uh, declined to take a direct role in helping change guidance when presented with data, the real world data. So not just going back to basic principles, but as Rachel's alluded, the real world data showing, you know, by, by the end of April, the government wasn't counting the numbers. It relied on clinicians to count the numbers because if something's not measured, it doesn't happen, right? But looking at the number of deaths that happened within the first few weeks, so there were 100 deaths. And by that stage, no ICU healthcare workers had died, but the, all 100 deaths were constituted in the other groups. And then in June, a preprint came from the John Radcliffe group, looking at 9,500 healthcare workers, which showed, again, a disproportionate infection rate in non-ICU healthcare workers. And then in October, a large report in Scotland, 150,000 healthcare workers and their families, showing again a disproportionate, uh, significantly increased risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection in non-ICU healthcare workers. Um, and also they, when they presented to hospital, they were sicker compared to non-healthcare workers. So presumably there's some kind of thing in the aerosol dose they're getting through being repetitively in a workspace before they get symptoms. So um, all of that real world data showed what then you know, would be the inevitable occurrence of ignoring the biological transmission characteristics of this organism. So it's hard for me when nerve tag says I'm not interested, but you can understand it. I, you know, who am I to ask them to do a bit of work? I don't commission their work. So uh, Department of Health and Social Care said it's not us. PHE said it's not us. It's NHS England. So go to NHS England and they say, oh, it's not us. Um, it's someone else it's the IPC cell so I write to MPs and then through MPs I get a response back from this organization that's called the IPC cell so an infection prevention control cell which is the final arbiter of IPC guidance and it's a bit like what you heard in January do you remember you heard from Yvonne Doyle um, uh, head of PHE or uh, uh, who, who said in her, in her PhD capacity, the guidance will remain the same. When the BMA and RCN approached and asked for the guidance to be changed. So in mm -hmm. saying the guidance should remain the same, what they're essentially doing is saying that the uh, standard pr practice of airborne PP for aerosol generating procedures should remain the same. But there's a dot, 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 and it's the local risk assessment that Rachel's been so fantastic in doing and recognising it's airborne. So what seems to be going on is that there is this thought from the IPC cell that local risk assessment is the be all and end all and uh, thinking very positively about them, 
as a group of clinicians trying to do what's best for the, the world, you would then expect them to be saying, well, and of course it's airborne. So the risk assessment should all be in keeping with airborne PPE. The problem is if you go to the guidance itself, the still written by them IPC guidance, the transmission characteristics are no longer contained within the PHE guides. It's very interesting. Version one, which I downloaded a copy of, uh, has the transmission characteristics, which says it's large droplet and aerosol during AGPs. So now the latest guidance links you to two documents. So you get one link to the WHO, July 2020, SARS-CoV-2 scientific brief. And that basically says lots of things that are against the nature of observed reality, which is quite interesting. You've got a lot of figures in WHO, or some figures in WHO, key decision-making positions who back then were very much anchored on trying to defend the droplet hypothesis. So anyway, that's one document that links to. And then the other document, strangely, links to a CDC document from May 2021. And that document says it's airborne. So if you look at those two, you know, so, so you have to look at the IPC and, and click two links to get to, you know, where uh, you, you, you can learn about the tra tra transmission. But if you just look at the PHE IPC without looking at those documents, well, firstly, you'd have the loggerheads of do I believe WHO or in 2020, Ju uh, July, or do I believe CDC May 2021? Tricky, I'd have to phone a friend, you know. Um, but looping back within the IPC guidance is this inevitability that airborne PPE is restricted to aerosol generating procedures because it's only airborne during AGPs. So you have this endless loop of risk assessment equals, according to the IPC, that lock-in. So you can then understand why a load of trusts are seeing this as mandatory. So standards for uh, better health, you know, with a nice uh, mm. guidance and so on. So guidance is actually seen mm. to be mandatory and organisations, as you all know, are kind of scored according to their adherence to nice guidance. So, so the word guidance in, in NHS parlance is actually mandatory. And, and you actually see then on some other web pages you go to looking at nice guidance and adherence, the word mandatory comes in. Um, so You've, you've got this kind of mandatory, mandatory mindset. Oh, you now you're telling me to risk assess. I'll do it. So even the best teams in the UK would risk assess and say, well, we're doing it right. So they're being, I would say, unusual clinicians in allowing people to do a risk assessment with a poor method. Uh, they should recognise that it's wrong and they should say, breathing, speaking, singing, coughing are all aerosol generating and these are demonstrated to be viable. So actually guys, we need to now put the transmission characteristics in keeping with the CDC, May 2021, and actually sneaked out a bit. I mean, I say that, but it's really odd. So the WHO released in a QA and a on the 30th of April, 2021, this very straightforward SARS-CoV-2 is airborne and it's released during particles released during, during speech, singing, coughing and so on. So it's only in the Q&A. If you go back to the SARS coronavirus web pages on WHO, the main headline, it doesn't say anything about it being airborne and talks about, you know, good hand washing and cough etiquette, coughing into a tissue and throwing it away. So you're, you're in this weird cycle where some organisations are coming out very openly saying it's airborne and the WHO still isn't enough. So PHE for a while was saying, and our guidance is in line with WHO. They're no longer able to say that because you can show them a WHO web page which says it's transmitted via the airborne route. So they're just saying it's a risk assessment thing. All do it locally. It's over to you. And you can come to your own conclusions as to why they're doing that. Right. I see. Thank you. Um, Helen, very briefly, um, you wanted to add to that, then I, need, I have a question for Rachel after this. Mm -hmm. Helen? Yeah, I was sorry, I muted myself. Um, yes, I will be brief. I was just going to draw out the themes that Dave said there. And, and um, uh, is healthcare a high reliability organisation, a high reliability system? Well, no, not in the way that you would look in other industries. So you would have a, a clarity, and this isn't just our view. There was an excellent report done by the CQC called Opening the Door to Change, which looked at culture in healthcare and safety. And what it did was highlight that the healthcare system doesn't operate as a system. So Dave's given a perfect example of where you've got multiple organizations, all with different responsibilities, all kind of passing the buck, taking some of it, information sharing that's incomplete or inconsistent and it's a real 
muddied picture. If I was a CEO or a director or non-exec of a trust, I wouldn't know the half of all of this. And yet it's my responsibility from a governor's point of view, the, the safety of my staff and patients. But the fact it's down to me in that organization to do these risk assessments, when you've got a really confused framework about what are the standards, what are the guidance, what is the good practice, I'll do a risk assessment if I know what good practice looks like and I'll apply it in my, my area rather than I have to start from scratch. And it is, a, it is another indication of where you, don't, you have this kind of amorphous number of organizations that operate quasi independently with no no kind of controlling mind i mean you know, that is the healthcare system as uh, as we operate it and other healthcare systems often do it so it makes it very difficult to take immediate and co uh, you know coordinated action in, in the pandemic but it is just systematic of, of a bigger problem of us not working as a as a safe system yeah thank you Rachel, I just had a thought there. Um, so clearly you were fortunate enough to have a lot of support from director of nursing, etc., and you were able to implement some safe and sensible guidance. Um, however, the reality is that um, there are still, um, I would say that the trust that have the correct guidance uh, for airborne PPR still in, in the minority. Um, what would you say to those people on the front line, those HCAs, those junior nurses, uh, those junior doctors um, who are dealing with these patients um, using inadequate PPE and are not being given the correct protection and are not getting any support from their superiors. I mean, that's a great question. First of all, I'm not sure they're in the minority actually that may be limited to the hospitals that I've been and helped out and worked in, but I would say right. the majority, I may totally be wrong here, but certainly my experience, um, that if you are working in a high risk area, like a respiratory support unit, a respiratory ward, where there is either known AGPs as per the Public Health England guidance, or there is a high likelihood, for example, if someone's coming in with a respiratory disease, virus, whatever, um, then they are wearing enhanced PPE. Um, oh, Dave's just typing in the chat there, 16 hospitals who manage airborne PPE in red zones. So, so, Dave, do you want to just really briefly kind of um, come in here and, and just clarify what you were trying to say there? Uh, yeah, I just want to congratulate Bradford, uh, who yesterday uh, released an email to staff saying that uh, all staff in red zones can wear FFP3. So, we, you know, earlier on, we spoke about uh, human beings being aerosol generating people um, and at a very infectious stage of their disease with very poor ventilation. So it's essential that the, the general COVID red zones, you have FFP3s on entrance, um, not just during AGPs. And so there are 16 now, if you include Bradford, NHS organisations. So I, I haven't bothered to look at how many NHS trusts there are in, in the UK, but it's depressing, right? So, Rachel, if you know, we, we could compare notes. Uh, and uh, I've got a little slide here. I could, uh, if I can, oh, hang on, if I go to my, here we go. So I, I can, sh oh, I can't share, my, I can share my screen if I don't put that up first. Um, anyway, I've got a slide that that uh, I can show. Oh, you've disabled screen sharing. Anyway, so um, I love it that you're seeing people, Rachel and you're going yay you're doing the right thing um sadly the uk wide position is very depressing echoing what helen says and what you, you, you've all said this is a problem right now that needs to be solved mm. immediately so on monday people have to be given their ffp3s yeah so what advice would i have okay i'd probably look to um you know maybe those organizations or trusts where they do implement what i would say is good gold standard practice which is protecting the staff I would then look at probably other softer metrics um, that I've described so staff sickness isn't an outcome measure but I would definitely as a manager as a leader I would be looking at that I would also be looking at my staff's mental health because certainly when staff feel protected um, you know there isn't that anxiety um, that obviously we know that our fellow colleagues have died, not only died, but I mean, become incredibly unwell with long COVID. Um, and I know a number of staff that have had COVID more than once. 
Um, I also would look at some of the translational evidence as well, but also some of the local guidelines are out there, like all of my papers from last year are on are open access. Um, they're on OneDrive, but I can send them if people want to get in touch yeah. with me. But also you just have to do a quick Google search now, looking at whatever particular area you're in, so whether it's respiratory physiology, lung function testing, an NIV ward, um, chest physiotherapy, and there's lots of local guidance out there. Now, a lot of the trusts say, oh, well, I don't care because it's not the PHE or the government guidance. But actually, this is where you need to gather your gather your strength and your power from your clinicians, like Helen says, patients as well. Mm. And also find your evidence within your organisation. So your staff sickness rates, your staff mental health and well-being. Um, how protected they feel within the organization. Um, and then I suppose just signpost them to other people. So, it's okay, if you don't believe me, here's this director of nursing, here's this direct chief HP, here's this, you know, and, and direct them to people who have had a, got a different policy. But don't stop lobbying for your own safety. Uh, if, you, if, if people would ask me what my um, default here is, is anyone in a red zone, let's call it, or in a in a high risk area with high risk procedures, all those staff would have enhanced PPE. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if, this, if this is a cost issue for the government, then there's a consequence with lower taxes or there's a consequence with free healthcare, isn't there? And if the pandemic has taught us anything now moving forward, it's that we really have to question the investment into protecting staff. So we've learned a lot about staff health and wellbeing. Yep. We've learned a lot about staff sickness and how we treat people who are on long-term sick. Um, and also what we expect of staff as well. I mean, even just over the past couple of days on Twitter for people who are on Twitter, staff saying, I can't do this again. I don't know if I can do this again. But what is the option? There is no option because we don't have a workforce we can pull in. We are it. So it, that, that is the other side of this pandemic, isn't it? I think that's what Helen and David have alluded to. So that would be my advice. Reach out to people like me, other system leaders, um, to help and yeah. support you. Yeah, yeah. We, we need many more of you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I know that they are waiting with a, uh, with a point, but I mean, what I would say is that just do what you need to do to protect yourself in the meantime. And if it means that you upset some people, then so what? At the end of the day, you know, you only indispensable to your loved ones um, if you die or become ill in the course of doing your job because you're not protected you're going to be replaced eventually uh, and don't allow yourself to be used like cannon fodder uh, and that's the line i would be taking as a clinician and that's the line i would be taking with uh, my juniors and my nursing colleagues and my hp colleagues to do the right thing, uh, you know, the guidance um, is outdated and it's wrong. Dave? It's very sad when you think of yourselves being used like that and feeling like that because you are incredibly valuable at helping organisations create safer systems of care. You've got an enormous amount of knowledge to share with people and to be told to just go and do a job and to be effectively silenced is 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 horrendous. But the thing I wanted to just raise was extending, a, a, you know, on what Rachel's talking about and what Helen's mentioned in terms of safe systems. So, you know, there are little local developments of uh, air filtration, portable air filters being installed in areas that are recognised to have poor ventilation. Uh, you know, the ventilation standards being released by WHO, European CDC, CDC, relating to CO2 monitoring. So it's not perfect. Um, if you've, you know, if you've got a certain situation, you could in theory have a low CO2, but a higher aerosol content. But essentially, this, the sort of simple approach is if your CO2 levels are above 600 and your parts per million, normal being 400 and a bit and climbing, sadly, um, you're, and, and you're, you're uh, around people that are singing or exercising aerobically, then there's a high aerosol release. So you should aim to have 600 or less in the, those areas. If you've got you know, quiet breathing, a calm library or something, you might be okay with 800. But in a healthcare setting, when you've got people in a, you know, a red zone, you might say, well, look, whatever the, you know, you, you need to have as near to normal fresh air CO2 as you can, but you need to filter the air. So you're stopping a barrier, sorry, you're putting a barrier to viral uh, admission to the alveoli over your face. It's not perfect. 
So if you filter the air, you create an additional layer of protection for healthcare workers. So reasonable measures, speaking to what Helen said earlier, you could argue that where areas have been measured and assessed to be either poorly ventilated or you could say just carte blanche any red area you also have where patients are known to have their highest infectious viral load so on the covid general wards you put HEPA filters in so they're portable they're plug-inable there's british companies and other companies that are manufacturing these things are plenty um, they're pretty low energy although that's an issue that would need to be sorted out eventually and you create a safer air to be filtered through the mask imperfectly. So there are studies ongoing, uh, but even without a study ongoing, you, you can work out from basic physical principles, it's gonna be beneficial. So much so that I know that Nottingham University hospitals bought 250 or, or acquired 250 HEPA filters uh, around Christmas time, presumably in, in reference to um, staff infection rates or whatever, or nosocomial rates. And again, through Helen, where, where's, you know, have Nottingham University hospitals released those data in a preprint or through the hub or in any other form? Well, I think it's quite secret. And that is really worrying for me to be in a system where clinicians are, are made to feel like they have less worth than they should. Their voices, which are incredibly valuable, are deliberately not being heard. And really good developments in certain locations that adhere to best principles of viral control are not immediately shared within the wider system. Absolutely. It seems like, you know, towing the party line is more important than doing the right thing for some people in positions of responsibility. And that is really, really sad when the cost could be a human life or a lifetime of disability. And Rachel, thanks for your comment in the chat box that an FFP3 is way cheaper uh, than losing uh, a healthcare worker uh, or, or, you know, uh, losing them to disability. Um, so I'm very conscious that we have <laughs> gone well over time. Um, uh, but um, I just had a final thought, and that is, you know, there are organisations that have got it wrong, and then they have revised their guidance. So there was a Cambridge study recently uh, where they noticed that um, they were uh, losing a lot of staff to sickness through COVID-19, and then they changed FFP3, and they eliminated eliminated uh, staff COVID. Um, so it can be done as if more evidence was needed. Helen, uh, very briefly, did you want to say something? Thank you. Uh, very briefly, I mean, we would we would be delighted to have the hub, as we've said, it's a free resource to, to collate some of this good practice. We know the culture of sharing information within organisations and across organisations is quite challenging. People don't feel they have the authority yeah, to yeah. do that, all yeah. the rest of it. So, you know, Rachel, I'd be delighted to put content and, and if any people that are listening to this uh, webinar want to provide us with, uh, you know, it's a, it's a moderated site, but we will put, we will put yeah. content on. Um, yeah. So we will happily contribute in, in any way we can. So we'll put um, the link to the hub um, in, the, in the description of the video, um, along with, the, you know, the resources that uh, Dave and Rachel have mentioned make sure Perfect. that they're all linked there. Um, so if there's anything that you haven't already emailed, uh, uh, because obviously the chat's going to disappear, uh, then please do email it so that Jess can then put it in the description. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered? And I can frame a question around that. Could I just add to Rachel's point about the cost? Uh, yeah. The cost of unsafe healthcare in the UK each year is about £5 billion. Pounds. So it costs to get it wrong. It's actually cheaper to do the ethical thing right, but you have to you have to take preventative action. You have to look up front. So we've got to get away from the idea that FFP3 is expensive, you know, because what you're looking at is the marginal cost, as you've just said, the marginal cost of a little bit of extra equipment, but the consequence on staff and patient safety is enormous and that has a much bigger socio-economic cost but actual financial cost as well so we've got to get out of this ridiculous mindset that these small investments in safety we can't afford we've got to look at it differently and i say that as an ex-finance director for, in the nhs of, i was a director for about 10 years so we've got to rethink that completely because that's a real barrier for change couldn't agree more. Um, Dave, Rachel, any closing thoughts, words? Nope. Okay, well, thank you very much, all three of you. 
uh, I have to say that this has been a most informative, illuminating, and but also very sobering discussion. Um, and uh, you know, it's sad that we are where we are at this moment in time. And I just hope that more people will listen and that more people will do the right thing. Thank you very much. Agreed. Everyone. It is quite clear now from the discussion that it was known from the beginning of the pandemic that SARS-CoV-2, the COVID virus, was airborne and therefore full enhanced protection, including an FFP3 mask, visor, gloves and a long sleeve gown was essential for healthcare workers to be protected against this virus. Even now, healthcare workers continue to be exposed and infected and PHE, Public Health England, refused to correct their guidance despite there being no shortage of PPE. In fact, there's been no shortage since June 2020. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of frontline workers face unemployment and financial uncertainty, let alone the risk to their quality of life and actual lives. It's a big issue. In our next film, we're going to be talking to Dr. Hardy Manji, a consultant neurologist from UCLH, about the plethora of uh, neurological symptoms that plague long haulers. Um, and hopefully he'll have some answers for us. Till next time.